Hello and welcome to the special discussion on the eve of the formation of the new government, the Narendra Modi led National Democratic Alliance government or as it is called Modi 3.0. Narendra Modi has been a very important political functionary of this country for the last two and a half decades and interestingly he has led governments either in the state or the center since 2002. That is a long 22 years. And even more interestingly, in the last 22 years, he has always had a full majority for his party, that is the Bharati Janata Party. But for the first time in his political career, he is being forced to run a coalition government or Mili Juli Sarkar, as it is being called in our political parlance. And to discuss this unique situation in Indian politics and the formation of the government and what priorities it will have, I have with me a prominent political and policy analyst of the country, one of India's most important communication consultants, Dilip Charyan. Thank you. Dilip, Thank you. welcome to this conversation jointly produced by the IDEM, Risala Update and the ADS. So, I have given you a small preface as to what we are looking at. So, Modi's first Mili Juli Sarkar, what does that mean for you? For me, uh, Venkatesh, Modi 3.0 will be really what I would call work in progress from day one. In all the Sarkars from 2002 onwards, it was work from day one. This is work in progress. Okay. So there is a big difference. We also have to remember that Mr. Modi is now 22 years older than he was when he first took on government. Um, in policy terms, a lot of his agenda is already well laid out, at least in the public space. Right. In terms of his own able and extremely detailed uh, presentations of it, he has made sure that his agenda in terms of goals for 2024 all the way up to 2047 yeah. are pretty much laid out. So policy makers would normally have expected to see either giant leaps or incremental moves depending on the mood of the moment and the testing of grounds and the availability of funds, policies would have been crafted in that direction. But I think this time we will not see that. That's why I said this will be work in progress. Uh, progress will be the constant. Work will be pretty relentless, but it will not be as even as it used to be before. Uh, or, or as even or as sensational as it used to be. You know, for a change, uh, you also have two coalition partners who, while they have states to manage and states to be proud of, they also see themselves as policy uh, creators. Okay. Um, Nitish has a pro-poor, pro-people orientation and uh, Chandra Babu Naidu has a very clear vision on technology, AI, infrastructure, urbanization, etc. Now, these are people who will not only want a share of power, but they will also want a share of voice. Right. And that is something which policy making gets affected by, who has share of voice. See, for example, even before the formation of the ministry, you have have you have voices from parties like the GDU and uh, LJP Ramilas Paswan calling for a reversal of the Agnivir project, which was kind of tom tom to be one unique uh, intervention by the uh, uh, Defence Ministry of Indian Indian Government uh, under the Modi 2.0. So there are you are going to have such issues coming up, and again uh, during the NDA 2.0 with Modi 2.0, they were able to pursue a kind of 
more or less uh, heavily loaded sectarian anti-Muslim agenda, like the withdrawal of the Article 370 or the CAA. What do you think will happen to such programs? I think the numbers tell the tale there. Very simply, the victories of both Chandrababu Naidu and of uh, Nitish and the uh, precipitous fall in Uttar Pradesh have all dealt out numbers for analysts to see that if you if you pursue a virulent, visible and on the edge of violent kind of policy of marginalizing, then you will find a pushback at the polling booth. And I think uh, there may be people who are unable to understand what to do about it. But I think a policy retreat from it is at least likely in terms of the the pyrotechnics around it. Okay. Or maybe the the operational integrity. I don't know. You know, my my sense is that when you do a retreat without your heart being in it, then it is only tactical okay. and is not strategic. So will that happen? I don't know. The jury is out on that. Does that need to happen? I think the jury has already spoken. So that conflict between what will actually happen to what needs to happen will, will decide also social policy. And on the economic front, I think, you know, uh, uh, the allies will also go with uh, the, the, the overall broad direction of uh, Modi 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, they will also, of course, in spite of the accusations about uh, the crony capitalists getting a uh, lot of share in the uh, economic emphasis of the Modi 2.0, uh, I think, you know, Nitish and uh, Chandra Babu Naidu may, may follow the same path in terms of, uh, and all the other alliance partners will also uh, agree to follow the same economic uh, policy path. The advantage that Mr. Modi has is that he is able to sell economic rhetoric very well. He covers it in a very thick layer of nationalism and forward-looking and as far as uh, you know, policies as far as the economy is concerned are con happen. Um, two things will decide this. One, the level of confidence that global investors will seek to display as far as Modi 3.0 is concerned. And the second thing is whether a whole bunch of new captains of industry will find their voice, their space and their contracts. And that's really what will decide what is the economic framework within which this works. Keep in mind that the single largest donor to the election bonds comes from Andhra Pradesh. Okay. So you are talking about people who have displayed their ability to invest in the process of politics and therefore the politicians from those states will have to take cognizance of that. And politicians from those places, politicians also would have to be kind of uh, valued at that level because they are from these states. Absolutely. And that raises the question which I am sure that you will come to but if I may preempt it, uh, a lot will also depend on who gets to be finance minister. That till the swearing is over, until the cabinet is announced, we don't know. So there will be speculation on that. But since we are recording this on the eve of the swearing in, let me say that yesterday, it was very clear because I was watching the markets on one screen and watching the speech on the other screen. And you could see that the markets began to move up. As the Prime not, Minister was speaking. Not when the Prime Minister was talking about the economy, but when Chandra Babu Naidu made the categorical assertion that I believe in an India which will grow very fast. Okay. Very quietly done, very measured statement, but that statement sent the market moving up much faster. So there was a psychological difference and that would never have been seen 
in Modi 1.0, 2.0 or pre-Modi 1.0. Right, right, right. This is very interesting. I mean, this is an observation only a, a policy analyst and a communication consultant like who you could have seen. So, what is your take on the kind of uh, uh, the ministries that uh, these parties may be demanding or, or that they are expected to get? The leaders I have met, and unfortunately I am not at liberty to reveal those, but I have met key people. Everybody seems to be wanting to give a narrative that we are in here to make sure that we give good governance, a stable government, etc. Having dealt with many of these players for multiple decades, I will say that these are men, unfortunately there are no women in the decision making process here. Uh, these are men who are known to be able to speak for cameras one way, to speak to friends one way and in closed rooms speak another way. And one would, I think we must recognize that in a sense only those who understand uh, the nuances of complex coalition politics will be able to understand the 2024 to 2029 India that's going to emerge. Yeah, so basically, uh, of course, you know, this is a big handicap that Modi has because he has never has had to kind of, you know, pursue coalition politics unlike a Vajpayee or an Adwani or even a Rajnath Singh. He has never been part of a coalition system. Uh, so, uh, what do you think uh, are the, are the cha big challenges that he is going to face and what are the possibilities, you know, or, or the potential uh, uh, positives that he can bring to this coalition? You know, to say that he has not worked with coalitions is technically correct. But any BJP government is an art of coalition between the political and the RSS wings of the same organization. So I think he's, he knows how to play that balance, number one. Number two, are we going to see the emergence of statesman Modi? as opposed to big Modi. Okay. I think that I credit him with enough smarts to be able to do what is necessary to survive. But stylistically, this is not a man who is used to coalition. Right. Even more fundamental from a policy point of view is that you had a situation for 10 years when the PMO virtually subsumed policy making of a political kind or even a bureaucratic kind in every ministry. Subsumed almost all ministries. Now that is not going to be possible yeah. because key ministries will inevitably, though the partners are constantly uh, serving the public the drivel that, oh, we, know, we are not interested in any particular ministry, but I think that you will see that key ministries will have to go. And when those ministers are in office, their officers will have to listen to them and not to the sound of a drum which is beating on Raisina Hill a little further away from them. Well, that's a very interesting proposition. So, as you, you were talking about the stylistic, the Modi style, style of functioning. So, what we have seen as journalists uh, throughout the uh, uh, entire time that Modi has held some official position or the other, right from 2002 onwards. I have been a journalist who was covering Gujarat at that point of time. I have covered national politics in the last 10 years, even before that. So, one has seen a Modi who kind of who does a monkey bath, but does not do a press conference. There is no give and take. Uh, and if you, if you in, the, in, the, in, the, in the words of a communication uh, consultant, I suppose, you know, there is no two-way communication. It has always been a one-way communication. So, how is that style of functioning, how is that track record going to impact the governance this time? I was at the home of two coalition partners last evening. In both homes, there were between 12 to 15 journalists okay. on the beat, harassing visitors, asking questions, expecting to enter and this wasn't the Delhi of exactly 10 days ago. Right. They were outside. 
in the outer lawns, yeah. not even inside the precincts of the home. Yeah. Here you have them inside the home, okay. dominating the drawing room, while the poor leader is sitting in a study. So I think that in a sense, these all the coalition partners are leaders who recognize the need to be open to their constituents, to their voters, to their the their friends and followers, etc. And you won't see that kind of fear of the other, whichever the other is defined as. That is, uh, you will you, not see. You that. can't draw the line. You cannot. You cannot say that. You know. You cannot enter the ministry. I mean, this was this was the case for the last five years. You know, even accredited journalists were not allowed to enter the ministries or ask any questions. So you are saying that that character is going out right at the beginning of this new government. In my observation, yeah. my personal observation, yeah. it already ended okay. day before yesterday. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, Venkatesh, as someone who has seen more ministries than many of today's journalists are because today if you're given a beat you're just staying on that beat because you barely have access to the boss mm -hmm. but someone like you who's cut across many ministries uh, you will be on more familiar territory next week than you would have been for the last uh, 48 so, uh, many many months yeah yeah absolutely so in fact you know i think that's a very good uh, uh, direction and uh, uh, as akhilesh yadav uh, talked about uh, the election date, he had characterized in all his public meetings, he had said that this will also not not only be the day when in Indian democracy will assert itself, but it is also the day the journalists, the media will be liberated. <laughs> in a sense, I think we are we are getting there. But still, uh, you have not asked, uh, responded to that specific question that I asked, what are the kind of ministries these coalition partners might be angling for uh, and how, what is the kind of response that one could uh, expect from the BJP and the, uh, the the leadership of the BJP? I think the leadership of the BJP is again to be seen in two parts. One is the what I call the Modi core group. Then there is the RSS surround sound. I think the RSS surround sound is likely to be more amenable. The core group may be more tougher. But uh, whether it's the water resources ministry or the railway ministry, whether it's the foreign ministry or whether it's the, um, the agriculture ministry, there are specific interests that each of these partners, these coalition partners have. And I think that the cloth will have to be cut not only for their interests but also decided by the, who they nominate. You cannot put square pegs in round holes, even though you've done that in the past, both in coalition governments as well as in Modi 1.0 and 2.0. But I think now that will change. What about the Home Ministry? This is of course you know, something which is be part of the rumour mills thing. Uh, both the Home Ministry as well as the position of the Speaker, which is very important because we had a Parliament Lok Sabha, especially the Lok Sabha over the last 10 years, which was kind of a bulldozer. So the speaker's position is also very important. So of course, we are, we are hearing a lot of rumors that you know that Chandra Babu Naidu has made a stake, has, has, has made a claim for it, and uh, there are also discussions that you know that people do not want uh, uh, a, a person like Amit Shah in the Home Ministry's uh, seat. So what are you hearing on all that? I think whatever we speak today hmm. must be. Um, must be bracketed between what the Prime Minister in his uh, very um, acerbic remark about the media said that I am not here to be guided by what breaking news says. But I think the breaking news today is that there are now visible centres of power which will decide these issues and no longer one centre of power. So will the Home Ministry be retained? If so, at what price? If so, what is the balance? And who was it balanced with? Was it an internal balance or an external balance? Right. So I think that uh, even though you might want to air this tonight, uh, the chances are that we will be wrong uh, within the hour. So it's best to leave that where it belongs. Right, right. 
But uh, you are talking about this uh, multiple uh, uh, power centers emerging. Of course, you essentially focused on the coalition partners and how they have, many of them have, you know, have a style of functioning which is uh, diametrically opposite to Modi's style of functioning where, where they welcome people, they supporters, media and all that. Uh, do you think that uh, this is, is also applicable to some of the leaders of the BJP who have been different who have had a different style of functioning from Modi's, like people like Rajanath Singh or Gadkari, who are kind of more open and more more open to uh, the, the people, the public, and the media. If you didn't see uh, Nitin Gadkari's tweet this morning, at I think seven or eight a.m. this morning, he put out a beautiful video of him welcoming his granddaughter's home. Okay. And they came rushing out of a car yeah. to hug him and that smile was something else. You have not seen that before for a long time. Okay. So what I am saying is, I am echoing what you have said. Also, the people who were present in central hall of old parliament building as they, they like to call it now, they saw the body language of, for example, uh, the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. Okay. Now, Yogi was not only looking sullen, but he seemed to have been largely ignored in the um, euphoria which was created there. Now, I think there are signals here because party inner balance was not something that had to be seriously taken. Right. Earlier. In Modi 1 and 2.0. Now, will it have to be seriously taken? Um, will the position that Khattar will get decide the future of uh, the BJP's chances in the Haryana elections, which are less than six months away? Um, will what Fadnavis does with himself, whether he does seppuku or whatever he does, will that be designed to affect the coalition possibilities for the Maharashtra elections. So, I think internal party equations will also be worth watching. Right, right. In fact, it is the, what we have seen as, uh, uh, as uh, it is not just an electoral kind of uh, shift in terms of losing a single party majority, but what we are seeing or going to see is a uh, uh, Perhaps, I mean, we can still not be very sure, but then you have already seen one major shift that is the, the emergence of new power centers in Delhi uh, 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 in contrast to what it was 10 years ago. And you are, you, you are, you are thinking that this will have uh, ramifications in terms of policy, in terms of style of functioning and uh, overall governance uh, that we are going to expect in the next five years. I think policy makers and policy watchers yeah. will have active watching and active participation to do. It's no longer going to be getting a handout from somewhere. Thank you, Dilip. I think it was very perceptive. Thank you. So, and uh, of course, I'll continue to pester you. And uh, You're most welcome. <laughs>